Send not to know for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee. <laughs> Filled with gratitude and a complete overabundance of food, uh, after a splendid Thanksgiving day, I welcome you here to the Unitarian Universalist Congregation at Shelter Rock. I'm the Reverend Ned White, Interim Senior Minister here at the Congregation, serving with Oscar Sinclair, our ministerial intern who is also today's preacher, and uh, other ministers, Natalie Fenimore and Jennifer Brower. We are delighted uh, to have you here on another glorious day in paradise, and we're delighted that you're here. In room 15, even as I speak, we are offering our free spirits program for children from kindergarten through grade four, or any uh, seniors who want to um, revisit their childhood. Children would, who would like to participate should go to room 15 now. So if, if there are any people there, just wanted to announce that. After the service, if you still have room after th Thursday's feast and Friday and Saturday's leftovers, uh, please join us for UU Cafe. We invite first time visitors to pick up a yellow meal ticket at the visitor's desk for a free lunch and hope that you can join us for that. If you took a gift request off the mitten tree, next Sunday, the, 12th, the 4th of December, is the last day to drop off your tagged and unwrapped gifts for children of families receiving services from the AIDS Center of Queens County. This coming Thursday, December 1st, the worship room here will be open from 4 to 7 p.m. in observance of World AIDS Day. Please stop by for readings, music, candle lighting in remembrance of those affected by HIV AIDS. Also on Thursday, there will be an open forum at the Islamic Center of Long Island between Long Island faith communities and law enforcement addressing post-election jitters, religious freedom, and ethnic targeting. That's 7 p.m. on this Thursday, December 1. I believe we'll have a flyer about that available in the lobby. Tickets are still available for the Peter Yarrow concert next Sunday, the 4th of December at 3 p.m. And finally, in the spirit of giving thanks and reaching out to one another, let's greet one another as is our custom each Sunday.
Good morning, everyone. As we begin our service together, as we do every week, we light a flaming chalice, the symbol of Unitarian Universalism lit by congregations from Cape Town to Manhasset to Portland. As we light our chalice this morning, hear these words by Kathleen McTeague. We come together this morning to remind ourselves and one another to rest for a moment at the forming edge of our lives, to resist the headlong tumble into the next moment until we claim for ourselves awareness and gratitude. Taking the time to look into one another's faces and seeing their communion, the reflection of our own eyes. This house of laughter and silence, memory and hope is hallowed by our presence together. Welcome. I invite us to join together in the words of affirmation, the song of affirmation, and our first hymn, uh, which will be in the gray hymnal number 347. If you want to get that uh, hymnal ready, um, then you can just stand all at once and stay standing until we finish singing. That would be great. If you want more exercise, it's all right to sit down and stand up between numbers if you'd like. After Thanksgiving, that may be a good idea. We'll start first with our words of affirmation that are printed in the order of service. I invite you to stand as we say these together. Love is the doctrine of this congregation. The quest of truth is its sacrament, and service is its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge in freedom, to serve human need. This do we affirm and covenant with each other. Now, if you will open to the opening hymn, number 347, Gather the Spirit.
Please be seated. We gather together each week in this space. And as the hymn says, we gather in thanks. Thanks for all that this community brings into our lives. And thanks for all of the people in it. As a token of that thanks, each week we set aside time for an offering. We give of ourselves to this congregation in our time, in our talents, and at times in our treasure. In this spirit of thanksgiving, let us give an offertory. The offering will now be gratefully received.
Mir ist unser Quartett so wunderbar. Danke sehr. Our responsive reading is number 586 in your gray hymnal. These are words of President Abraham Lincoln, taken from a speech in Edwardsville, Illinois in 1858 and from his second inaugural address in 1865, reading number 586, and we will read this responsively. As labor is the common burden of our race, so the effort of some to shift their share of the burden onto the shoulders of others is the great, durable curse of the race. This expresses my idea of democracy. Whatever differs from this to the extent of the difference is no democracy. Destroy this spirit and we have planted the seeds of despotism at our own doors. Why should there not be a patient confidence in the ultimate justice of the people? Is there any better or equal hope in the world? Our hymn, number 159, this is my song, to John Sibelius' um, uh, Finlandia, uh, this is my song, O God of All the Nations, 159. I invite you to stand as you are able. The reading this morning is from the Reverend John Haynes Holmes 
from a sermon that he gave at the Unitarian Church of the Messiah. Interesting name. The Unitarian Church of the Messiah on April 1st, 1917, almost 100 years ago today. Nothing has happened in this period of time to change my opinion of war. On the contrary, much has happened to strengthen and confirm it. I do not deny that there have been times in the past when war, like the storms of the sea, has seemed unescapable. What I do deny is that these facts of history touch in any remotest way the judgment of ethics and religion that war is wrong. War is an open and utter violation of Christianity. If war is right, then Christianity is wrong, false, a lie. If Christianity is right, then war is wrong, false, a lie. The God revealed in the Gospels and by every great spiritual leader is no God of battles. He lifts no sword. He asks no sacrifice of blood. Is the God of all men, Jew and Gentile, bond and free. His law is love one another. Resist not evil with evil. Overcome evil with good. Such a God and such a law others may reconcile with war, but I cannot. And what I cannot do, I will not profess to do. Please join me in a moment of prayer and meditation. Loving God, we remember at this time of year the many blessings we enjoy here on Long Island in 2016. Family ties that encourage and sustain us. Health that enables us to live productive lives of service. Proximity to both great natural beauty and the thriving culture of one of the world's great cities. Food of spectacular variety that energizes us a citizenry that cares about the future of our children and our children's children. We give you thanks for these blessings, which we enjoy not because of any special merit of our own, but because of your grace and generosity. Amidst these blessings, O God, may we show like generosity to those who may not share fully in this abundance, the lonely, the jobless, the poor, the outcast, the immigrant, the refugee. May we keep these, your children, in our minds as we go about our daily work, that we may bring our region and our nation ever closer to the goal of peace, liberty, and justice for all. So may it always be shalom. Amen. Now I invite any of you who would like to light candles of joy or sorrow to come forward now in silence. As all of us join you in silence, focusing our intentions on these candles of celebration and concern. Please come forward.
I invite you to remain seated for our meditation hymn number 352. It's 352. These words are based on a Hungarian hymn text sung to this same tune by Unitarian congregations in Transylvania, that part of Romania where Unitarian church, churches have worshipped for over 400 years. Number 352. As I get out my manuscript here, I do want to say one thing to lead off questions. I know that the title of the service on the front of the order of service is not the title of the sermon. I knew months ago that I was going to preach today on John Haynes Holmes, and Unity was the name of the magazine that he edited for 40 years. But as I was writing the sermon, the name of the sermon changed as happens sometimes. I hope by the end of the sermon, uh, you will agree to me, with me that this is, in fact, a better name. Reflecting in his memoir, on the early days of his ministry, Reverend John Haynes Holmes wrote, it would be folly, even actual falsehood, for me to declare I was not afraid that Sunday morning, April 1st, 1917. The truth is, I was scared when I opened the door leading into my pulpit, and still more scared when I saw the throng that had gathered to hear me speak. A goodly proportion of this crowd were my own people. I saw their faces looking up at mine. Others were curiosity seekers, still others seekers after the latest sensation of the hour. And to make no mistake, Reverend Holmes was the sensation of the hour that April morning in Manhattan. The first page headline, A1 above the fold, in the New York Times the next morning reads, Holmes won't fight, so offers to resign. A sales nation in sermon. Says, no order of a president can force me to the business of killing. Pacifist pastor Trustees call pacifist pastor an impractical idealist, but won't drop him. The New York Times did not write for the spoken word, pacifist pastor, an impractical idealist. I had to practice that one at home a couple times. Five days later, on April 6th, Congress voted to declare war on Germany, and the United States entered the First World War. 
Holmes, as one of the most prominent pacifist voices on the East Coast, was suddenly in a very lonely position, in a very lonely, uncertain time. Almost immediately, there were calls to ban his writing. And while the trustees at New York's Church of the Messiah voted to support his ministry, they did not vote to support his personal beliefs. Many pacifists over the course of the next few years lost their jobs and livelihoods during the war. Those were uncertain times for Unitarians and for our country. And we live today in uncertain times. I do not think that it's appropriate or helpful to re-argue the recent election from the pulpit. But what does seem clear is that we as a country and as a faith are sailing into uncharted waters. Regardless of our party affiliation or who we voted for, there's a lot of anxiety, uncertainty, fear, and anger. In Kalamazoo, Michigan, where my family's from, in Kalamazoo, Michigan, in 1999, the GM plant closed. Sure, there's a new consortium that owns the plant, but Midlink Business Park's distribution center employs a quarter of what GM's stamping plant used to, without a pension. In a generation, in a generation, the town has gone from a place where you could get a solid middle-class job with a high school diploma to a town where you can't afford the taxes on the home that you inherited from your parents. So you have to sell it. In 1999, there were 5,000 people unemployed in the county. 10 years later, that, that number was 20,000. And while that number has fallen in the last few years, recovery wasn't restoration. The rage and the worry that grew with it are still there. And across the state from Kalamazoo in Dearborn, 40% of the town is Muslim American. In the 10 days between November 8th and 18th, there were 30 hate crimes reported in the state of Michigan. In an average year, there are six. Folks in Dearborn watched this month as, uh, national, as national news broadcast video of a conference held in Washington, D.C., blocks from the White House, where the keynote session ended with calls of hail victory and a salute not seen since 1945. It's a time, as Matthew would say, of wars and rumors of war. Between the election, the economy, worry about our families, our loved ones, our children, our children's children, rumors and threats of terrorism, a changing climate, fiscal insecurity, Brexit, health care scares, racial tension, schools, can all feel a little overwhelming. Deep breath. So here's what I'm thankful for this year. I'm thankful to be here, to be part of the tradition that is Unitarian Universalism. Because we've been here before in the uncertainty and anxiety, the fear and the anger. And I believe that we as a faith, as a community, were made for these times. We are at our best when we stand for the values we proclaim. In the midst of job losses and hate crimes, we proclaim that all have inherent dignity. In days of intolerance and distrust, we proclaim that all are free and responsible for the meaning that they find in life. In times of disconnection, we proclaim that all are part of an interconnected whole. The more anxious the time, the more these values are important, the more we should proclaim them. We've been at this a long time. 
This year, Shelter Rock is celebrating its 75th anniversary, so there will probably be more historically focused sermons than usual this year. But I would like to go back uh, somewhat earlier than Shelter Rock's founding to 1568. the time when Unitarianism was just forming. The first generations of Unitarians in Eastern Europe were trying to figure out who they were and how they would be in the world. In 1568, religious wars throughout the continent of Europe had killed hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of people. The French religious wars had just ended, the Thirty Years' War had just started the first pieces of it, at least. By 1568, the Counter-Reformation was well underway, and one of the few things that the Catholics and the Protestants, who had been fighting, could agree on is that the Unitarians were definitely heretics. (laughs) In the midst of all this, the early Unitarian church had the ear of John Sigismund, King of Hungary. Hungary at the time encompassed parts of what is now Hungary and Romania and was divided between Catholics, Lutherans, Calvinists, and Unitarians. And like much of Europe in the 16th century, Hungary was an ancient, anxious, uncertain place. With some help prompting and possibly ghostwriting, by Unitarians, the king proclaimed in an edict of toleration in 1568 that in every place the preachers shall preach and explain the gospel, each according to his understanding of it, preachers at the time being uniformly men. And if the congregations like it, it is well. If not, no one shall compel them, for their souls would not be satisfied, but they shall be permitted to keep a preacher of whom they approve. It's hard listening to it now in 2016 to realize how revolutionary that document is. In the midst of a century of religious wars, Unitarians developed this document protecting not just their rights as a religious minority, but those of other Christian denominations. And while the edict is a product of its time, It spoke to toleration of all Christian denominations and sects, but not non-Christian faiths. It enshrined religious toleration and pluralism in the story we tell ourselves as Unitarians. In the midst of anxious, uncertain, and divided times, Unitarians proclaimed a different way of being. We've grown a bit in the last 450 years. This morning, Ned announced that religious communities across Long Island are joining together this week with each other and with police departments to find a way of being together, of fighting back against the hatred and the divisiveness we have seen in our society. Like Hungary 450 years ago, we are trying to live together as people of faith and as governments. Unlike 450 years ago, it's more than the King of Hungary, the Catholics, the Protestants, and the Unitarians. Today, the religious communities and government agencies of Nassau County are being asked to convene by the Islamic Center of Long Island and Temple Sinai in Roslyn. I'll be there on Thursday, and I hope you will join us. I began this sermon and this service with pacifism, so I want to go back to that. And I'm doing so knowing that arguments around pacifism have been a part of Unitarian and Universalism for a hundred years. I was talking with somebody about this sermon and, uh, this week, and, and they said, uh, what can you say about Unitarian Universalism and pacifism? And I said, well, I can say that we argue about it a lot. We're not a peace church. 
It's very possible to be a faithful Unitarian Universalist and not be a pacifist. There are UU ministers that I love and look up to serving as chaplains in the armed forces. Still, I think the question of pacifism is a good example of Unitarians and Universalists taking a moral stand at counterpoint to the culture that they live in. There are at least two lines that I've found between pacifism and this pulpit. The first is this place. Because before it was Shelter Rock, it was the Unitarian Society of the North Shore. And 75 years ago, what is now UUCSR was the Unitarian Church School for Northern Nassau County. And in the fall of 1941, 75 years ago this autumn, the church school hired its first director, a Norman Blair. And by the summer of 1942, Norman Blair had resigned as director of the church school. You see, he had been drafted. And he spent the rest of the war in an alternative service camp for conscientious objectors. The other connection between pacifism and this pulpit is me. My parents joined a Unitarian Universalist congregation with my sister and me in 2000. So the most formative years of my Unitarian Universalism were in the shadow of September 11th and in the stories of all the peace activists at that congregation. I got my draft card in October of 2003, the year the United States invaded Iraq. And saying that you were against the war in 2003 was not the most popular opinion. I preached my first sermon that fall on registering as a conscientious objector while I was learning a lot about Unitarian Universalism and who I would be in the world, I was also learning a lot about what it feels like to proclaim unpopular, uncomfortable opinions in public. One of the sharpest mem memories I have of high school is of uh, two or three friends and I organizing an anti-war protest in front of my high school. All of half a dozen of us walking back and forth with signs. Maybe you remember them, no blood for oil, not in my name. As we were walking back and forth, the high school baseball team came out in force. They stood directly in front of us, maybe two feet, looking us straight in the eye and chanted USA, USA for an hour. There were friends of mine on that baseball team. I'm still friends with some of them. This moment that we're in now feels a little like that one. Voices are raised, people are scared. We don't really know what comes next. But we've been here before. Those protests 15 years ago were the first time I heard stories about Unitarians and Universalists standing up for peace as the country went to war. In the year after Reverend Holmes made front page news in the New York Time, Times, many pacifist ministers lost their jobs. Draft protesters went to jail under the Espionage and Sedition Acts. Newspapers were temporarily shut down and the American Unitarian Association formally condemned preachers that preached pacifism from the pulpit. What must it have been like to stand by deeply held beliefs despite a culture that says everything in reverse, that seems not to even hear you? Pacifism was Holmes's stand. What is it that you will stand for? regardless of what the culture around you tells you 
is right. Unitarian Universalists have a lot of experience taking unpopular stands, and it's, it's not just peace and war. Two members of my congregation in Baltimore sued the state of Maryland over 10 years ago for the right to be married. And they knew, they knew when they filed the lawsuit that there was no way they were going to win. But they loved each other. They had been together for 30 years. They wanted to be married, so they, along with the ACLU, filed a lawsuit. They made it all the way to the Court of Appeals. The appeal was denied. Some years later, in a much different state of Maryland, they were the first same-sex wedding in downtown Baltimore. In the last few years, Unitarian Universalist congregations have begun to hang banners and signs on their property, proclaiming that despite all that society says, black lives matter. And the only story, the only story as ubiquitous as those signs getting torn down or vandalized is stories of those congregations putting them back up, recommitted to the work. A suburban congregation I've spent some time with is now on their fifth sign since October. The last one was vandalized the morning after the election. Someone used white paint to paint over the black in Black Lives Matter. Within a week, it was replaced, this time by a sign signed by every member of the congregation. And I can't believe I'm saying this, but in the four days since I wrote the first draft of this sermon, that sign has been torn down. That one lasted three days. And that congregation is deciding this week how, not if, they should replace it. We live in uncertain, anxious times. But I believe that the lesson of our history as a faith is that in moments of uncertainty and anxiety, we rise to be our best selves. Our faith proclaims human dignity, both individually and collectively. We encourage each to search for their own truth and meaning in their lives. We practice the democratic process in our congregations. We encourage it in the world. We know that our destinies are caught up with each other in a single interconnected web. And we have time and time and time again proclaimed those values in public, out loud, no matter what the world around us says. So we were made for these times. We have the tools, we have the stories. I think we have the will to be a force for good in the world. Setbacks and victories come together. In 1917, John Haynes Holmes became a founding member of what became the ACLU. Church of the Messiah, where he had been afraid of his welcome, eventually moved away from the American Unitarian Association and renamed itself the Community Church of New York. Reverend Holmes served Community Church for over 40 years. In that time, serving as one of the founding members of the NAACP and helping the construction of a new building on East 35th Street in Manhattan. It's still there. And when war came again in 1941, Holmes continued to stand by his convictions. Writing, and now, what shall the pacifist do? The answer is easy. Stand fast by principle and carry on. This does not mean opposition to or interference with war activities, but it does mean the exercise of the full freedom established in a democracy to voice honest opinion, to be loyal to fixed conviction, and to advance the eternal cause of peace. So let us not fear the uncertainty of these times. Let us use it to voice honest opinion, loyal to our convictions, to recommit 
to the essential values of our faith. We will proclaim these values wherever the path leads us. We are made for these times. Amen. And now, if you will, rise as you are able to sing our closing hymn, number 157, Step by Step, The Longest March. Let us go forth from this place with the courage of our convictions, knowing that the long history of our tradition is with us. Go in peace, go in kindness, go in love, go in faith. Amen. <laughs>